I'm here to talk a little bit about benchmarking. Um, hopefully, you'll find the conversation interesting. Um, my name is Peter Friedenbach. I am a performance architect at Clusterix. I'm actually not going to be talking so much about our Clusterix product. If you want to know more about Clusterix, we have a booth down in the exhibit hall. Um, by all means, join us. Um, my marketing and sales team asked me to come in and basically talk a little bit about benchmarking and some of the stuff that I, being a performance architect, have been living in the benchmark world for many years. And so that's what I'll be getting into kind of today. Um, purpose of the talk, I guess, is kind of demystify benchmarks. I hope to give you some insights into what's in the benchmarking world, what's kind of going on in there. Um, I'm going to do so in kind of three parts. First of all, I'm going to go back in some history. Um, a little bit of gray hair here. Uh, hopefully I won't date myself too much, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about where the world of benchmarking came from, what's going on with it. My purpose in doing that in part is because I think uh, history repeats itself. So we'll talk a little bit about what's kind of the world was like and what's going on now, and maybe there's a little bit of repeating on some of that. Um, then give a brief introduction to some tools kits that are available today. Um, there's far more information about this stuff located online than I'll actually cover. And then I'll get into, I guess, some words of wisdom or points and stuff on how to evaluate a database using benchmarks and um, best practices and lessons I've learned on that line. So um, let's go back in history a little bit. Um, hopefully this comes across a little bit in the projector here, but this is a particular cartoon that appeared in 1988 in Computer World. So in 88, Computer World was one of the significant trade magazines of the computer industry at the time. Basically, we got Robin Hood sitting in the forest, vendor written on his thing. He has shot arrows all over the place, hitting trees in random patterns, and he is pointing a bullseye around one of them saying, uh, put me down for another bullseye. And the commentary on the back of it was the database management system benchmark test. That was the world of database benchmarking in the 80s. Um, basically, what had grown out of the industry is the concept of a database was there. Relational database products were being marketed and sold. Uh, the valley here was particularly rich in a lot of companies that were participating in that, in that space. And they were throwing out wild performance claims right and left. The concept of a transaction was understood. So everywhere you turned around, you heard about TPS, how many transactions per second we could do, et cetera, et cetera. And they were just inundating the market with it. What the hell did the transaction mean? What did it mean TPS? It was running rampant in terms of what was going on. So this was often called in the time at that point the TPS wars. Vendors were clobbering each other over the head saying, oh, we got more TPS than you have. Never defining what the hell TPS was or anything that was going on like that. Um, at the time, actually, what we considered a TPS was actually a workload that came out of IBM in the 70s. It was a workload that was actually modeling Bank of America's branch and teller system at the time. And they created a very simple workload called debit credit, which debit credit was basically if you walked up to your teller in your branch, you wanted to make a deposit or withdrawal money. This is before ATM days, dating myself a little bit. But uh, you would do that. The system would transact that, right? So they built a quick model of this thing. Um, in IBM, that was actually built in the 70s. They let it slip out of IBM towards the end of the 70s and into the 80s in the marketplace. It was called TP1 at the point. TP1 at the time, and it was used extensively all over the place. It particularly flowed out of IBM when individuals that worked in IBM moved on. One particular individual importance is Jim Gray, who's one of the principal people around transaction processing and database systems. He left and went to Tandem Systems, brought TP1 with him. Uh, TP1 was rampant, spread around, being used. And so Jim actually got together with a group of people and decided we need to create a benchmark, a standard around that benchmark. And he published a paper in 1985. The paper was actually introduced three different benchmarks. One of them was a sort, one of them was a scan benchmark, and then this debit credit benchmark to kind of set the stage of how we would measure a database system. Uh, his paper was very well received, and he actually published it under the name of uh, Ant All, which means you know a group of people. He actually had over 20 people in the industry that joined him on it, but the reality was the benchmark was his, and they were all kind of behind it. His thinking at the time was he was going to standardize what it meant. If you were going to claim TPS, this is what it meant. Well, first of all, it meant you had to have ACID properties, right? And Jim's actually one of the founders of what ACID taught atomic, consistent, isolated, durable criteria that a, a database transaction should meet. 
he also introduced the concept in there in price performance. It wasn't enough to just talk about how much TPS you had, how much bucks did the TPS cost, right? If I'm gonna get lots of TPS, am I paying lots of bucks for it or not, right? He also introduced a concept of response time. In other words, particularly in the old TP space, how long it takes you to do the transaction matters, not just how many transactions you do. Um, and he introduced some concept that you would actually scale databases behind this stuff. Um, this was the first attempt to try and get a common language behind what would be a database benchmark in the marketplace. Of course, this is 1985. The cartoon I showed you was still 1988. Even with a definition in Datamation, still wild, rampant claims everywhere in the industry about what performance was. Um, so there was a call for an industry standards to come up. So how many of you ever heard of the Transaction Processing Performance Council? TPCC or any of that? Right. So the council was actually formulated in the 1980 time, time frame. It was then chartered to try and build a standard out of this so that if two different vendors published database benchmark results, you could actually compare those results, right? Um, this is a little bit of a timeline of the TPC. I'm not going to go into any of those particular points. It's more that it's just there to document things. But the TPC basically, it was a nonprofit that was funded to basically define these things. Uh, the standards, as you know, well, in the day, TPCA was actually debit credit, the previous benchmark that I just mentioned. It was standardized under TPCA. TPCB is the same benchmark, actually, but ran as a database only test. A was a system test. TPCC replaced TPCA as the old TP workload. Some of you probably have heard of TPCH, which is the current kind of decision support and analytic query model that comes out of the TPC. There's a number of different other ones in here. Um, what was good about the TPC at the time is the TPC actually defined the rules of the game. You know, so you could get two different companies published TPC results and you could compare those results and actually draw something from that conclusion. Um, they also, for the first time, really made, you know, um, it made those competitive performance com comparisons uh, comparable. Um, they introduced the concept that results should have been audited. In other words, if you put out a result that claimed to be TPC results, there was an independent auditor who actually came in and looked at how you ran the system and basically passed judgment on that. And um, the standards, from the standpoint of defining base workloads, first with debit credit, which was TPCA, and then later with TPCC, which actually exists today in many flavors out there, they actually created workloads that helped drive innovation in the industry. Um, the bad side of the TPC, so they created a model of running benchmarks that was extremely expensive. Turns out the only people who could afford to run them were big system vendors. I worked for Hewlett Packard in the day uh, and worked on actually TPC type benchmarks in those days or whatever, but only HP, who, uh, IBM, DEC in its time, other companies, that, the big companies, they were the ones who could afford to run the benchmarks. Turns out the database vendors didn't really run the benchmarks. They would get a hardware vendor to sponsor the benchmark using their database product. Right? And uh, the other thing that kind of came into the TPC is that there was always this element in the TPC that was around bench marketing or gamesmanship. In other words, uh, depending on where you were and which company or whatever, sometimes marketing was driving more of it than technology, right? In terms of what was going on, the tricks that could be played. Oftentimes, changes were made to products to make them favor a benchmark that led to favorable results in the benchmark, but didn't, weren't necessarily appable in the real world and stuff. And over time, certain workloads became worthless. What you know today is TPCH was actually originally called TPCD. TPCD got obsoleted by basically virtual, you know, um, virtualized views, basically uh, obsoleted TPCD because it, no, the queries were no longer challenging enough to a system. Um, but the more problem with the, actually the TPC is that it was, ended up being dominated by vendors. Hardware vendors and database vendors. The original vision of the TPC is that there would be a third party at the table, customers. Customers that wanted systems evaluated at a certain level, you know, particularly maybe the big customers out there in the world that were big IT shops. They would be helped determining what these standards were. Turns out they never showed up. So it was only the vendors. Turns out the vendors have their own private interests. Hardware vendors, they really only wanted to sell hardware. And even though these are database benchmarks, they didn't really care what the database stuff underneath it was. 
and eventually it deteriorated to, as long as Oracle or Michael, Microsoft SQL could run this stuff, they didn't care about the standard after that, right? Database vendors, they were motivated by what? They wanted to make sure that if a new standard got adopted, nobody else could run it. <laughs> they wanted to justify their R&D expenses into these standards. And so there have been standards that have been written and passed. There's a TPC DS standard passed over two years ago. It took actually over five years to get standard. Nobody's ever published a result on it. I have yet to work on a product that can even execute all the SQL that's in the standard. And I've worked for years at HP and now at Clusterix in this environment. So, you know, it became dominated by vendors who had their own selfish needs on what was going on. Um, and being a kind of vendor standards, standards body, it was really slow to evolve to the changing marketplace. Got a couple of pictures to kind of show the impact of the TPC in two different ways. This picture is kind of, let's look at the positive side of the TPC. This is a logarithmic scale here of throughput over time of different benchmark publications in the TPC. It looks a little sparse here in the 1990s only because the benchmarks of the day there have actually been removed from the TPC site and we don't have those data points anymore. But these are still benchmarks that are considered still active from the TPC standpoint. So you can go out to the TPC world and get these results. But you'll notice in the beginning days of TPCC, which is the current old TP benchmark on there, you know, it wasn't uncommon to have something around the 500 transactions per minute when they first published the scale. Last big number up here, this is around 50 million transactions per minute. So in the lifespan of this benchmark, it saw a performance go from 500 to 50 million, right? That was kind of the impact of focusing the industry on workloads. And you'll see as a new workload comes on place, TPCH, it gets very popular and carries on. There's some other workloads that have since been defined. The last couple of these are actually more Hadoop-based workloads that are defined down here. But, you know, not a lot of publication on it. So there's a different message underneath this thing. And this is a look at that same data now, but we'll start from the year 2000. How many results are being published per year out of this standards body? And you'll notice a sharp trend down. In fact, there's nothing yet this year. So this was the standards body created to solve this problem of creating competitive performance data, and it's not being used anymore. There's, it's been over the last database benchmark was actually in 2015. The only publications last year were actually Hadoop-based tests. So one could argue that the TPC has really become irrelevant, right? Why? Well, I think the industry really changed, right? Uh, what's the difference? Back in the 80s and 90s, right, it was a vendor-controlled stripping proprietary systems with proprietary software into an environment where you could afford to spend the big bucks to do the benchmarks because it was all big bucks. Open source didn't exist in those days, right? Open source has basically stripped this all out, among other things. And I think in this conference particularly, you know, none of you are here as advocates of Oracle, let's say, right? MySQL is more the common thread in here, purely open source from that standpoint. So what does that mean for you if you want to do evaluation of systems now using benchmarks? The old world of the public, you know, vendors publishing numbers to you has kind of gone by the wayside or, or in other sense actually gone back closer to the TPS wars as they existed. You can get random great claims of performance out of the vendors. Uh, the good news is, is it's not as expensive right now to benchmark systems anymore, right? And there are toolkits to make that happen. A couple toolkits that are out there. Uh, one toolkit, SysBench. I'm sure most of you probably heard SysBench. Um, Perconi uses it extensively. In fact, the, the thing currently is, it's an open source toolkit, but the moderator of this toolkit is an employee of Percona. Right. So uh, what is SysBench? So SysBench really actually is a tool set that wasn't necessarily a database benchmark. It's a benchmark to assess your system's readiness to run a database. It, act, it has multiple suites in it. It has a suite that will test CPU, suite that will test disk, a suite that will test memory. Um, there's a couple others in there too. Plus an implementation of MySQL that will allow you to run some MySQL workload on a system. Um, in that MySQL world, it allows you to mix certain types of statements together to form a transaction. 
You can run them as single you know, statement transactions, or you can mix together different things. In our shop right now, we do use a lot of Sysbench. We end up mixing it a little bit and different things. It's all customized, though, in terms of what you really kind of run as a mix and stuff. But it allows you to make a database workload, basically, based off that mix. Very popular in the MySQL world. Um, I've been working for Clusterx for about two and a half years. I have to admit that but prior to coming to Clusterx, I wasn't actually in the MySQL world. Uh, the previous product I worked on was a NeoView product out of HP. It was a large scale out um, decision support system. Um, there's an open source version of it now called Trifodian out in the marketplace, but it was not the MySQL marketplace. So I've, I never used Sysbench until I actually joined Clusterx. It wasn't something that was in that toolkit or whatever. Um, definitely, you know, go out and online, you're going to get a lot more information. It's a simple to use, easy toolkit that you can bring down if you wanted to use that. Uh, another one that's getting a lot of publicity or press these days in terms of published results, are your guests around it or whatever, is YCSB, also known as Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. It's a benchmark written out of, well, originally it was written by uh, people working for Yahoo, but um, right now it's moderated by a former Yahoo employee that works for Google. Um, it is a tool set that's there similar to Sysbench, from a database perspective, you can drive a load against it, but it's really geared to NoSQL environments, right? It doesn't have a concept of multi-statement transaction integrity or anything like that built into it, right? It, but it's, used, it's very popular in the NoSQL world. You'll find this um, being used in many different places. Basically, it has, well, the way we, I use it is pretty much it has Git and put operations against an, uh, a value-paired store. But, the original papers and stuff justify the marketplace that it's kind of going after, and it's used extensively. Uh, another one that we will use a lot, what we do. So you can get more information on that. Um, there are many other of these toolkits that are available out there. Um, the TPC workloads, while the TPC potentially, one can argue, has become slightly irrelevant from a standpoint of a publication body, the workloads of the TPC still live on. In fact, uh, TPCC, you know, if, if you installed MySQL today in the MySQL benchmark toolkit, there's a benchmark in there called DBT2 that you can get out of that. That is TPCC, our version of it, right? Uh, I internally within Clusterx continue to run debit credit. Um, De Jim Gray actually continued to run debit credit up until Jim Gray um, went sailboating out of the bay uh, in what is it, 2008, I think, and then disappeared. Um, it was lost at sea in a sailboat. But you know, a couple months before he left, he actually published a paper with still quoting debit credit numbers in that paper, right? So he still was using that. Um, and then I use an internal version of TPCC. We call it order entry. That was the, the buzz name, like debit credits, TPCA, order entry was TPCC. We still, I still use an internal version of that. But you can find these things. There's multiple versions of, of TPC, particularly TPCC-like workloads that are still out there. Um, there are other toolkits that are available. There's an old TP bench toolkit that's out there. There's some other ones out there that are open source things. Um, so you can find these things. Um, if you really are looking for a toolkit. In other words, if you wanted to do some benchmarking, you don't necessarily have to build your own tool to do it. There are toolkits, right, that'll do that for you. So, given you got the toolkit in front of you, you're having to do your own benchmarking, potentially to do an assessment of the system. Some things of what I would advise on this thing. Um, first key thing up front, um, know your objective. Because that should drive you to what you're actually kind of looking for or whatever. What are you trying to measure? You know, in a big sense, where, which marketplace are you going after? You, do you want old TP transaction capability? Do you want analytic capability? You're working with big data and an analysis of that data. Are you doing uh, more NoSQL type work or whatever? It's understanding what that is. Do you need full asset properties in it? Do, you know, there's plenty of questions along this space. Um, I'm reminded of just one thing that we actually did about a year ago. We were approached by a vendor in a request for information, RFI. They were looking for different things, and they actually asked us in the RFI for data on YCSB numbers. And reading their RFI, their RFI kind of read like they were trying to implement a big object store. 
And it was like, hmm, but they're talking to us, Clusterx. We're not necessarily an object store company. We're more of an old TP database. Why are they talking to us? We had YCSB numbers, though. So we, we gave them back a reply. And we basically said, well, here, this is what we do if we were running our system like YCSB. We didn't use full transactional integrity. We, we have a capability of doing relaxed transactional integrity. We ran it with that, some other stuff, some nice numbers. But then we also gave them another part of the RFI saying, but you know, we're really a database product that does transactional databases, and this is what we do. They read our response or whatever, and they surprisingly to us came back and said, hmm, well, we are building this object store. Maybe you're not the choice for the object store, but this object store has a metadata store behind it, which is a relational database. Currently MySQL, maybe we should be talking to you about that. Actually it turned into a nice little deal for us from our standpoint. But uh, it's a case where you know, they're they were looking for something, but maybe something else coming in, what they were kind of looking for. You know, what you're looking for should drive really what you're kind of going out there to look after and stuff. So first thing up front, just know your objectives. We often get people in that are looking for things, but, but they don't really have understood what exactly they're looking for, and often are therefore using data that's not necessarily pertinent to what they're going after. Given that you know what you want, you have a choice now. How are you going to pursue it? Uh, you can rely on published results. But I would say in this day and age, uh, my word of advice for you would be trust but verify, right? Because uh, the TPC is gone. The world that you could compare published results is not there, right? So when you get a result that hits the paper from some vendor that claims some level of read performance on a MySQL type environment, Go figure out whether that's really true or not and what you're doing, right? Um, I'd be wary also of any company that comes to you and says, well, here, we got published, and we do this. So I, I'm, I'd be wary of myself. Uh, our numbers show that we're better than this. <laughs> you know, I, I, in all honesty, sometimes it shows you how little the person who ran the benchmarks knows how to run the other product. Because <laughs> they're an expert on one product, not necessarily the other. But, uh, but the reality is, is without the TPC, there is nothing in the industry right now. We're back into TPS wars. So if you're going to see claims on the marketplace, trust but verify, right? Good point is, is it doesn't cost a lot of money to verify anymore, right? Leverage these open source toolkits if you need them, right? There's a lot to running a benchmark that's beyond just implementing the workload. A good driver will do many things for you in terms of coordinating the workload and stuff like that. These are tested tools who have worked out the driving capabilities on these things. Um, I've often taken one of these things, like just recently, we had a problem in our product that showed up in one of our customer sites. We were having a hard time understanding it. I actually took Sysbench, hacked it up again, and created a different workload, but used the driver to drive the workload and actually recreated internally a test case that showed a performance problem that we had in a customer site. Provided a lot of uh, focus now in R&D to actually fix the problem. But I didn't use Sysbench for the way Sysbench was run, but I, I used the toolkit to drive it. Um, often the other choice that we get, and this is actually kind of the mode of operation that we see a lot from the customers that we're dealing with, is uh, come up with a proof of concept and and send your vendors through that proof of concept, right? Um, I'm not supposed to say that because it's kind of expensive for our, from our side to always do proof of concepts for every customer that comes in the door. But the reality is uh, you can control a little bit of what the workload is based on your own proof of concept to send the vendors through and stuff. So now, having done that, what are you looking for when you get to performance? Oftentimes, people come to me and they want to know, well, what is the performance of this and they're looking for a number. Give me the number. I often get this from management above me. <laughs> you know, what's the performance of our new release? The reality is, is that performance is a variable that changes. And in fact, at the core base, performance is really a trade-off between throughput and latency. And I'm speaking particularly in the old TP space, but this is true even in analytics and even in other places. In other words, you can run a system at very low latency, or you can run a system at very high throughput. The trick is running a latency system that's at low latency, high throughput. One of the ways to project this is what I would call performance curve. Um, 
And being in this game for a long time, I actually was kind of slow coming to performance curves. The first time I saw this type of curve actually published was in YCSB's papers. And what it is is traditionally people want to publish performance number by let's say I run a system and I vary the number of users. So I show you a throughput graph that varies based off the number of users. But then I'll show you somewhere else maybe a graph that shows you how latency. And because I want to show you that variable number of users that I use to create the numbers. This graph throws away that variable number of users and says, no, I will run the system at various number of users and report to you the throughput and latency response time that I got off of this workload. And it should be a curve that looks something like this. Goodness in this environment is down here in the uh, right lower corner from your perspective, right? That's actually goodness. Now, some people are challenged when they see these curves because they like curves goodness to be at the top of the curve, right? And everything, whereas this is purporting goodness here, which is what? High throughput, low latency, right? And any good system will go through some transition where as you reach the capacity point of the system, you start trading off increases in throughput with increases in latency, right? And so by drawing a picture, you get better per perspective of what's going on in the system. Um, one of the things that kind of works in this thing is, if I take a workload and I walk up to a system, in other words, I want to measure a database on some piece of hardware, I pick a 4XL node, let's say C3 4XL node off of AWS. I put a database on this thing. I want to run a workload on it. How do I know that the system's even sized correctly for the workload, right? I'll get a number back that says I'm doing this much throughput with this much latency, but is that good or bad? The only way you get that perspective is by drawing the full curve. So without getting a full curve, you really don't have that perspective. Now, to get the curve, there's a variable underneath here. That's what you have to change in your test to make that happen. Most of the testing I do, I actually use, because I'm in a company right now, we're focused on online transaction processing. Concurrent processing is big to us. Number of streams, concurrent number of threads, that's the variable that I often use in the testing I've done. My previous job, I was actually working for a company that's more geared towards analytics. Uh, and we often were scaling the size of the data. That was the variable underneath it. Single stream, but scale the size of the data through the thing. But you know, it can be one of any, there's a number of different variables that can be this, but you gotta pick something to be your variable. You set up your environment and then start toggling that variable to learn what the capacity point of that machine is for that workload, right? Um, it actually took me a little while to get used to these curves. Um, and I've actually brought my new company <laughs> screaming <laughs> into this environment too, because you know, I've worked at Cluster for about two and a half years for about, First six months, the head of engineering who I report to wasn't buying this stuff. <laughs> but I'm, he's come around. So. <laughs> hmm. Next thing, if you're going to run a benchmark and you're going to draw that curve, it's highly important to understand where the bottleneck is. Why did throughput turn into increase in latency, right? If you don't go to the trouble of doing that, uh, somebody who I worked with who's actually potentially far wiser than me in this subject or whatever used to say, if you're not collecting any performance data while you're running a performance test, you're just generating random numbers. Because unless you understand what that bottleneck is, it, you really can't make a comment on what's going on. And where do bottlenecks come from? Well, they could be CPU disk networking. They could be the hardware you're running on, right? Uh, in the database, lots of opportunities for bottlenecks, right? On internal structures, right? On uh, buffer managers, transaction managers, the write ahead log, or any other places. You know, there's a lot of opportunities for bottlenecks inside the database itself. And of course, the application itself could be bottlenecking. In the database on locks or in the application, uh, we've done a lot of benchmarks and stuff in more of the online world. Uh, positioning our product underneath Magento, which is a system that runs a lot of the online um, commerce websites in the world and stuff. Oftentimes when we would run a benchmark on Magento, it's the application server that's the bottleneck, not the database and everything. But you know, we'd be focused on the, you know, how can we improve the performance of the database? And it's like, unless you're looking at your application servers and realizing they're out of gas. The even more embarrassing thing is sometimes it's the drivers. And, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've been burned by this, and I just got burned by this a couple weeks ago. 
Uh, particularly, I was asked to rerun some data that we had done oh, a little over a year ago using YCSB. YCSB is a Java-based driver that unless you go out of your way, there's only so much you can drive off a driver system through YCSB. And we were going after some big numbers on a big cluster or whatever, and I, and I forgot about that. And you know, I'm getting a little senior senility. I don't know, I'm not that old, but uh, I forgot that we needed more drivers. And I run the test, and, and damned if the curve comes through, the curve's going, and then boom, straight up. We then spent another day and a half trying to interrogate our IT team and other things. What had changed in our data center? Why can't I reproduce the results that I had there? <laughs> After a while, I read deeper into my notes to realize that instead of running it with eight drivers, the last time I had ran that number, I had to throw 13 drivers at it because the driver's the bottleneck, and I hadn't bothered to look at the data that I got off the driver to reinforce that, right? So unless you've gone to the trouble of understanding where the bottleneck is, you can draw bad conclusions, and you can waste a lot of your time on what's going on. So a uh, common mistake, and I am guilty of that as much as anybody. Right, so another part of a performance testing, uh, limit the number of variables. In uh, other words, uh, if you, in performance testing, typically you're doing a performance test to do a comparison to something. Maybe to itself, like in this release is faster than that release, but oftentimes it's against another product, against something else, against another design, there's something involved in it, stuff. There are tremendous amounts of variables in here. You know, you could be running on different hardware, operating system, or database system than where you started from, right? You could be running uh, different modes from the box. Many times people run database benchmarks on the box itself. Other times they use an external client, right? Because we sell a cluster product, we're almost always using an external driver coming after this thing, you know? But, how you would drive it, that's going to make a difference. That, this is the difference between what originally was called TPC-A and TPC-B, <laughs> back in the original parts of the TPC world or whatever. It was, it was that debit credit workload, but how did you drive it? Right. Um, besides the variables that come from the database, ODBC, JDBC, are you using session poolings? How do you br bring these things in? Are you using potentially other proprietary connections into this thing? Right, uh, what is it, uh, async link or something? It's a, it's a particular connection that comes with MySQL cluster or whatever that's their proprietary version of how to do a connectivity model. You know, there's a lot of variables that are kind of in this thing. Um, plus, you know, am I going to be running, this is prepared exact, restored procedures, or what I would call sessionless, meaning establish the session, run the transaction, end the session. You know, how is that being set up? You can get radically different performance numbers for the same workload depending upon what model you're using from an execution model coming through here. Um, beyond the size of the traditional variables is how much data do I have? How many concurrent am I running? That's the complexity of the query set that I'm running. These are other things or whatever. In this world of all these variables, your trick is to try to limit as many variables as you can and hold them constant in real performance work. Um, so real performance work is an exercise of control. How can you control as many of those variables and only vary something? Thing. If you allow too many of these things to vary, you're just generating random performance numbers. right? And you can't really do, draw conclusions off that. A couple other things to kind of comment on here. Because um, I work for a company that we're in a scale-out model, and I've actually been working in scale-out databases now for about a decade. Um, so um, there's always this quest out there for linear scalability. And actually, I guess this is kind of topical, because I think Percona just put out a blog on um, above linear scalability on something. So my, my sales and marketing side have been banging my ear for the last day trying to react to what Percona just put out. But, um, the reality is you can get above linear scalability if you relieve the bottleneck in a workload. <laughs> it will show you above linear scalability. Um, but the point of what I'm kind of working at from here is I, we would often get customers that would arrive to us and say, here's the workload, run it on this machine, and then run it on twice the hardware and show me that you scale. The problem with that model is 
A system will scale linearly or near linearly only if the workload is actually appropriately sized in the lower two systems, right? Um, and I, I'd like to use this chart. This is actually a chart we put together trying to prove some uh, over 2 million transactions per second in an AWS environment. But if you focus down in the bottom of this chart, you'll actually see that if I, these data points represent kind of similar type of load, doubling the load on a cluster at that time. If I took this four node AWS environment, which is this blue thing, and compared it to this 64 node AWS environment, and took the bottom nodes here, that is not a linear scaling picture. In fact, it doesn't show, you know, I went from four to 64 and I didn't get that much increase in performance per se. My latency went way up. Why is that? At this point, this data point's not really using the four node environment. It hasn't exhausted that environment. There's no way it's scaling up to there, right? But you go out further and get to like this data point, which is up here, basically in this environment or whatever, when you move from here to here by increasing it, you've got the scale out that you are looking for because you're wanting a workload that is taxed here and not taxed down here, right? So, so getting scalability or showing scalability in an environment, you know, uh, it has to be appropriately sized and then you can basically show scale out of that. Ah, uh, myths at point seven. Um, are benchmarks representable? I can't tell you how many times over the years I've been in meetings where we'll argue about the performance of a benchmark and then somebody will ask us, well, which is more representable? Let me tell you now, benchmarks are not representable, period. <laughs> uh, there's been, but there's lots of debates and stuff on this thing. Uh, to me, a good benchmark is a test of a system that is testing the critical path or the main path or the essential part of the system that's needed for just basic good processing. My statement down here, kind of in a little mathematical sense, good benchmark performance is a necessary but not sufficient condition for good application performance. In other words, a good benchmark will test a system if you can't meet that test, you really, your system really shouldn't be considered there. But just because you met the test doesn't necessarily meet, mean you'll meet the full application goal. And it is extremely hard to come up with a representable benchmark. So this may not be politically correct, but the way it was described to me in my early days or whatever is that benchmarks are like bikinis. They purport to show you everything but hide what's truly essential. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, there's a myth out there what's representable, they're not representable. The reality was, and I, I was involved in the TPC in the days when TPC-A was replaced by TPC-C. The argument at the time was debit credit was too simple. We need a more complex benchmark. We went to a standards body. We came up with the definition of TPC-C. We got it out there. From a standpoint of predicting system level performance of a database, it was actually no different than TPC-A. You could actually take TPCA results at the time, send them through a slight algorithm, and predict the TPCC result at the time. You know, but it was perceived in the marketplace as much better because it was more complex. Well, the TPC kept on that track and actually created benchmarks now that are perceived to be much more complex, and nobody publishes against them. So, um, so I think that it's a myth out there. Let's see, I think I'm getting pretty close to being done here. So let me make a few comments how I use these tools, right? So um, as a performance architect, my job involves many different things, but one of it is to drive the measurement of our product, to drive our engineering team to improve the performance of our product. It's also to analyze and get into customer situations or other things, reproduce problems internally and stuff like that. Um, I, one thing I have to do oftentimes is, you know, so we'll get, results in or something on a cluster, on a set of, set of systems. And one of the basic questions right up front is what's the health of that system, right? Turns out um, Sysbench, particularly not the database side of Sysbench, but the CPU side and the file I.O. side, I like those tests. Um, they're very good at doing a quick assessment of the health of your system. So like, in, for example, in an AWS environment, oftentimes you can spin up a couple AWS nodes and 
you may get some variance between the nodes. Quick tests on this stuff will actually show you whether or not you actually got a node that's, that's not living up to what you want it to be, right? So I'll use that. Another system that, because I'm a, I work for a vendor that we're in a clustered environment, we're very sensitive to the network performance, I'll actually use another tool that's out there. It's called iPerf. It's another measurement tool that allows you to measure um, network performance off of it. I'll, I've created a quick test that'll do a quick test of a network environment. Using these, they kind of become my smoke test to figure out whether a system cluster or environment is actually up to speed. Is it any good? If you're going to do comparisons between two different products on two different sets of hardware, I highly recommend you get some assessment of the CPU variance between them. Now, CPUs can vary under a lot of things. Syspence has just implemented one of those workloads, uh, but it's, it's a decent CPU test for a benchmark, for a database. Um, so that's assessing the system health. If I want to assess the database health, well, it depends on whether I'm going after a relational database, ACID property environment. If I'm using a tool set for that, I'll actually, we'll use Sysbench for that, potentially. And we'll often throw together some mix, 90-10, uh, 80-20, reads to write ratios in that mix, trying to make it a multi-statement transaction kind of in there. We'll run this thing through that. Um, if I'm going after something that's more YCSB or more non-ACID, I'll, I'll actually pick up YCSB to use that. Uh, YCSB comes with several predefined workloads, uh, A, B, C, D. There's actually uh, there's six of them total, but I tend to use a, C, a through C on them or whatever. But it's a way of doing an assessment. There's a lot of publication on YCSB results out and stuff like that. So if I'm in the NoSQL world trying to respond to that, I'll be there. If I'm in the SQL world trying to respond to ACID, I'll be doing this. this. I still use TPC-like workloads because they're better transactional benchmarks than even those two. But I'm using my own, own internal toolkit on this stuff. I could easily pick up the ones that are out there too to use them and stuff. Um, so, you know, I internally within Clusterx, I'll often talk about debit credit order entry results, TPCA, TPCC. I'm still using them. They're good workloads. We also use TPCH a little bit, but it's not our focus, so we don't really focus on it all that much and everything. Um, so the TPC lives on, but I guess the word of warning is you can never put those results out in the public domain claiming their TPC numbers because you didn't follow the rules of the law, right? But the workloads will live long. Um, and then I often have to model specific problems. Like I, I referenced a few minutes ago that I've actually just recently hacked a version of Sysbench to do a particular load um, off of something. But I've also hacked together using these drivers or other things. These actually end up being Java-based for me, but I've hacked those together to do different things to, to run things. But we'll, I'll create custom things depending upon what we're looking at. Uh, that's all I have here for now. I think I have just a few minutes more if you have questions. Otherwise, before I take a question, uh, my company is sponsoring a happy hour that is just starting right now down in the uh, exhibit hall in the Clusterix Lounge, I guess. But uh, if you like a drink, I'll be down there too. So uh, by all means. So I can take a couple of questions now real quick if you have any. Otherwise, maybe it's time to go get a drink. Anybody? There's the question. What are we waiting for? I will be downstairs too if you want to talk performance benchmarks or anything. I appreciate you coming this afternoon and uh, let's go get a drink. Thank you.